It's a good month to remember India's fight against colonial imperialism. Freedom was fought for by leaders, people's movements and ideas. It was also fought for by the press. Mahatma Gandhi himself was a leader, lawyer and a journalist. Gandhi wrote extensively to mobilize the masses against the British. He understood the power of the press. But so did the British. For colonial rule to sustain its hold over the rest of people, the British had to control the flow of information. And how do you control the flow of information? You control the press. But each time the British said to the press, Tum sala gulam lo, hamari juti ke niche hi rahega. The press spoke back in creative and subversive ways. Let us look at five ways in which the British suppressed the press in colonial India and how the press spoke back. The year was 1857. The British were still recovering from the shock of the first organized rebellion against their rule. The printed word had played a key role in stirring this revolt. And so the 1857 rebellion set the ball rolling for the laws that would fetter the press in colonial India. To begin with, the Licensing Act of 1857 and the Registration Act of 1867 were brought in to gag the press. Publications now had to obtain licenses for running a printing press and be wary of critiquing the government. It also gave the colonial administration the veto power to stop any publication or circulation of printed material. These regulations were a forerunner to the Vernacular Act of 1878. The most stringent of its kind, the Vernacular Act came down on Indian language publications to curb seditious writing. It gave the colonial government extensive rights to censor reports and editorials. The idea was to prevent regional language newspapers from exposing the shortcomings of the Raj. Aimed at Indian languages, this law did not apply to writings in English. Amrit Bazar Patrika, a particular target, was a bilingual weekly in Bengal. It had caught the attention of the British for its reporting on the exploitation of indigo farmers. Now, once the Vernacular Act came into effect, Amrit Bazar Patrika had to deal with editorial censorship when it came to writings in Bengali. So what did they do? They switched to writing solely in English and continued to be fiercely political. Post-independence, the Patrika spoke for communal harmony. During the Great Calcutta killings of 1947, the paper left its editorial columns blank for three days. Amrit Bazar Patrika ceased publication after 1991. As the nationalist movement gathered momentum at the turn of the century, it brought with it more censorship and control. Official Secrets Act of 1903, Newspapers Incitement to Offences Act 1908, Criminal Law Amendment Act 1908 and the Press Act of 1910. All intended to muzzle nationalist publications that were building political consciousness among the people. The big bad amongst these was the Press Act of 1910. The law allowed the government to take financial securities from newspapers so that they couldn't publish any content deemed critical of the administration. They would lose the money if they did publish any such thing. This hit the Indian newspapers hard. The act prosecuted nearly a thousand Indian newspapers and about 500 were proscribed. Not only did it stifle dissent, the British also made good money off it. Rupees 5 lakh in the coffers of the Raj in the first five years of the act according to an official record. There was another legal monster haunting free speech in British India. Sedition. Brought over from England to British India, the Sedition Act was introduced in the IPC in 1870. And many of our leaders were tried for writings that incited disaffection against the government. Bal Gangadhar Tilak was tried thrice and convicted twice under the Sedition Law for his writings in Kesari a Marathi newspaper founded by him. He was accused of inciting the public against the Raj and fostering feelings of enmity. You know who else was charged with sedition? Gandhi, Maulana Azad and Nehru. When Gandhi was tried for his political articles in Young India, he pled guilty. Section 124A under which I am happily charged is perhaps the prince among the political sections of the Indian Penal Code designed to suppress the liberty of the citizen. Affection cannot be manufactured or regulated by law. 
If one has no affection for a person or system, one should be free to give the fullest expression to his disaffection, so long as he does not contemplate, promote or incite violence. In recent years, sedition has come back in vogue. Activists, journalists and even students have been booked under the same law that once Gandhi was booked under. The Supreme Court a few months ago put the operation of the law on hold. When Gandhi led the SALT march in 1930, he extensively used the press to give voice to the civil disobedience movement. He wrote himself and implored newspapers across the country to join him in rallying the masses. The British responded with a strict clampdown. Gandhi was arrested and the Press Emergency Act of 1931 was enacted. Under its ambit, you couldn't question the government's authority, publications had to pay security and there was a provision for imprisonment. Again, thousands of newspapers were criminally charged in Bombay, Bengal, Madras, Delhi and UP. But did that stop the press? It did not. The written word soldiered on. Finally came the 1940s, the final showdown between the Indian press and the British government. World War II framed the setup and the colonial government clamped down with all fangs bared. The Defence of India Act was weaponized to introduce pre-censorship. The press could not report on the poor state of affairs in India, whether it be the hunger strike by prison inmates of 1939 or the Bengal famine of 1943. Previous press acts were amended to bring in stricter penalties and longer jail time. International war news was filtered and propaganda news manufactured in its stead. Strict restrictions were imposed on reporting on Congress activities like the Quit India movement. Gandhi openly called out the British for using the war as an excuse to suppress political agitation here in India. In the name of the war effort, all expressions of opinion is effectively suppressed unless an enterprising editor or publisher risks the loss of his press. Now, unable to openly speak without inviting government ire, the written word moulded its ways. Newspapers went underground or found their way out through unauthorised news sheets. Secret radio stations sprung up and messages were written even on walls. One such story is that of a young Usha Mehta. A 22-year-old student moved by Gandhi's words at the launch of the Quit India movement. Do or die, we shall either free India or die in the attempt. She launched an underground radio station within a week of the speech. With the help of a transmitter and some activist friends, Usha spent the next few months escaping the British and urging people to join the resistance. Sometimes, quite literally. They had police vans chasing them. They aired their broadcast from Bombay and kept moving locations to throw the police off their trail. All news that was banned in newspapers could be aired, from merchants refusing to export rice to arrests of leaders and civilians. The radio station had a short stint of three months and the last broadcast was dramatic. They wrapped up their last program on air with the police banging at their door as they played One Day Matram. The equipment was seized, young Usha was convicted and sent to jail. But her spirit remained intact, symbolic of the many, many others who waged similar battles against the suppression of the press in British India. We know how that story ends. India gained her freedom in August 1947, and Usha was there to witness it. Now to present times cut to 2022, India has fallen to its lowest ever position on the World Press Freedom Index and termed one of the world's most dangerous countries for journalists. Guess what? Many of the laws we spoke of and similar laws enacted in independent India are still on the books today. Angres chale gaye, lekin press freedom ko khatam karne wale sedition jaise laws chhod gaye, jo aaj kal ki sarkaro ke bohat kaam a rahe hain. The subscription model is something that keeps news on your float, but we need hundreds of thousands of people to completely transform the news ecosystem. So you pay for news, so it serves you. So click on the link with this video, subscribe to News Laundry and pay to keep news free. And say, my heart is free,